Dear Father, I just pray for all these women today. I thank you for what you've been doing in their lives. I thank you for what you're doing in their hearts. And I continue to pray that you would work in their lives, work in their hearts, continue to reveal yourself to them. Father, there are so many times where we hear lies and we start to believe them. Sometimes we hear a lie and we can find out that we, we know it's a lie. But after it's repeated over and over and over, we start to think that maybe it's true. And we just ask and pray that you would give us your word. Help us to dive into your word. Help give us the desire to want to know you better. Father, we talk a lot about the duty sometimes of what a Christian life is. And we also talk about the delight. And we ask that you would give us a delight in you that to follow you wouldn't look like an obligation or a duty or something that we feel like we have to do or some kind of box to check, but they would be able to come to you and know that we get to serve a wonderful God, that it's a delight and an honor and a joy to serve you in our life. So we just pray that you would continue to, to speak to us and continue to, to work in our lives that we can apply your word to our lives as we leave today. So we thank you and we praise your name. Amen. So how many of you guys have heard the story of Mary and Martha? Raise your hands. Okay, good. Um, Mary and Martha are pretty popular. They're, there's a lot about Mary and Martha. There's a story that I want to talk to you about that's in Luke 10. Uh, 38 through 42. So if you have Bibles, awesome. If you don't have Bibles, it'll be up on the screen probably. Uh, but there's also some Bibles in the, in the seats there too. So um, if you want to open up to Luke 10, 38 to 42, I just want to, to kind of go through what the story is. Like I said, I can give you a lot of my opinions, but my opinions really don't matter. So the first thing I want to do to start off is just to read Scripture. So Luke 10, 38 through 42, says, Now as they were traveling alone, he entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word, settled at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all of her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken from her. So you, after I get to speak to you guys for a little bit, you guys are going to go back and have some conversation break. Some of the conversation that you guys get to have is going to be about Mary and Martha. I just want you to kind of go over a couple of questions that you can kind of consider as we kind of talk through Mary and Martha's life a little bit. So consider the two characters, Mary and Martha. Who do you resonate more with? Mary the contemplative or Martha the activist? First question. Second question. How would you express the relationship Mary and Martha have with Christ? Third question, do you compare yourself with others and how does that affect your attitude towards Christ? And you can even extend that into how does that affect your attitude toward Christ and how does that affect your attitude toward others? So let me give you a little historical context here quick first. So uh, Martha is the head of uh, the, the maiden of her household um, and when it came down to people accepting uh, others into their house, when rabbis would go around with their disciples. This was not a, a typical practice thing. Uh, they would go into men's houses that, that had women that would help serve and whatnot, but they typically didn't go into just a couple sisters' houses. And, and Mary and Martha, the situation, when you go back and look at scholars, they say it's a pretty rare situation, and it's pretty odd for Jesus to be there in the first place. And in the story, if we just read it plainly, as far as what we can see, we're still trying to come up with what's going on in the story. And 
you have to you have to kind of continue to read through Luke just before this to really figure out what's going on. It's not just Jesus, Mary, and Martha in a room, and nobody else is there. So this isn't the talk where I'm going to tell you, you know, a man should never be in a house with a couple sisters and, you know, go down that road. That's, that's not what the story is actually about. So when, just before this in Luke, uh, you have Jesus' main disciples, the, the guys that he, that he is with. And there's 12 main disciples that we talk about a lot. And then after that, there's these 72 all, also disciples that he kind of sends out. This story happens right after these 72 disciples just come back and they're traveling. So it doesn't necessarily specify in the story, but there could be close to 100 people with Jesus. So when you all of a sudden get the context of the story a little bit, um, you can kind of see Jesus walking in with his disciples. You got 100 guys and you got Mary and Martha. And um, Martha's first instinct is, hey, let's take care of these guys. That was, that was a very hospitable thing. Uh, Jewish culture, hospitality was huge. And, and to walk into somebody's house, you would immediately want to take care of them. Food was a, a, an easy preparation where it's like, hey, you've been traveling. Let me feed you, right? So you have this scenario where all of a sudden Mary and Martha are in the house. And again, it's not just Mary sitting at Jesus' feet but also probably a lot of disciples. And that was actually the place for disciples. When Jesus or a rabbi would teach, they would sit at his feet. So whenever Jesus was teaching, it wasn't just anybody, you know, there, everybody who was willing to listen, especially his disciples, like that was their place. So even in this context, you see that there's a lot of work to do if you were to have a household full of a bunch of men that needed food. Um, how many of you guys have teenage boys? Okay, some of you guys have teenage boys. Um, if, if you don't have teenage boys, just ask anyone that just raised their hand. Um, how, your refrigerator usually is empty all the time. And then you look back and you're like, I just filled it two days ago. And then it comes again. And to feed 100 people seems like an impossible task. Just before this, Jesus feeds 5,000. So, you know, Mar- Martha... Preparing food for 100 seems like an easy task, right? Not the case. If you had 100 people and you had to find food, we don't have the local grocery store. You just don't run downtown, grab some food, come back. You got to go get water at the well. You have to prepare food that you probably already either have. You might even have to slaughter an animal. Like there's a whole lot going on here. And Martha is starting to kind of get some anxiety going on. There's some, there's some nerves. First off, I want to kind of talk a little bit more about Mary and Martha and their relationship with Jesus. So this is already kind of an interesting context with Jesus and his disciples in Mary and Martha's house. So you also can get a little bit more information with Mary and Martha through the Gospels. But in John 11 is where you really see the same thing. Bethany is is the town that they're describing, the same place of where they're at. And in Bethany, in chapter 11 in John, There is Lazarus, who they said is Mary and Martha's brother, and he's dead. And Jesus comes, and we know the the end of the story, you know, spoiler alert, he raises Lazarus from the dead. Pretty awesome right there. But when you look at John chapter 11, the relationship Jesus has with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are, it's pretty intimate. It's not just a, hey, I saw you once. Hey, we're kind of friends or acquaintances. It's we've been friends. We know each other to the point where even it's specified in John that verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So even when Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead, you continue on through 11, and it gets to the point where Jesus weeps with them. There's an intimate moment between Jesus, Mary, and Martha. Mary and Martha are devastated because of what's going on with their brother. And Jesus doesn't just come and perform a miracle. He doesn't do what he has done to to other uh, royal officials with their sons and just said, hey, they're healed. You can go back home. Jesus never goes to their house, just says, hey, they're healed. Go back home. Believe me. And then they go back and they, they, they find that their son's healed. This is a story where Jesus knows Lazarus is dead. He says he's sleeping from his disciples, and then they go to their house. 
Jesus takes the time and the opportunity to be intimate with this, this family, these siblings. So that gives you a little bit of context of what Jesus' relationship looks like with Mary and Martha. So when Mary and Martha are speaking with Jesus and you see Mary at Jesus' feet and Martha is working, how many of you guys, um, I say guys, I apologize, how many of you ladies uh, have ever gotten to that point where you have felt you have had a laundry list that is piling up and there's so much to do? Okay. Okay. There we go. How many, how many of you, since you have been here this weekend, yesterday or today, uh, have already been processing and thinking through all the different things you should be or could be or maybe are missing right now? Amen, right? That can be a pretty natural context. The interesting part of this story is not Martha. The interesting part of the story is Mary. When you look at this story, Martha seems like she would be like any one of us. There's a laundry list. There's a whole lot of work to do. And guess what? Somebody's got to do it. There's one main truth that's in this parable. And I know that there are a lot of different things. As even I was looking at Mary and Martha uh, and just kind of even looking them up online. There are a whole lot of stories and contexts that we try to fit them into to make us feel good. And they're not really great theological um, points on what the text is saying. If you look at the text directly, with just Mary and Martha, what's going on, you have a whole lot of people that are hungry. Martha's working hard. She's trying to figure out how to get it all done. Martha's response is, I need help. Is that a good response? There's a lot of time when we have a big laundry list of stuff to do and we need help. Martha goes and says, hey, I need help. This is also the other interesting part with their relationship, this relationship they have with Jesus. How many of you guys would would all of a sudden come and before Jesus, the Messiah, God, and tell him to tell your sister to help you work? You can almost see this picture of Martha where one hand is on her hip and she's got another like wooden spoon. I, maybe I got too many wooden spoons when I was young. A wooden spoon in her hand and just got the like, Jesus, do you see? I have work to do. Tell my sister to get back to work. That picture can be pretty natural to us. That picture for us, we all have a lot of work to do, a lot of things. And the story isn't saying not to work. So we're going to get into that here in just a second. But the story really is landing on these two different people. So let's look a little bit about Martha right now when it comes down to Martha's heart. Where is Martha's heart right now? So put yourself in Martha's place for a moment. How distracted would you be with 100 people in your house, crowded at your home, at all the high cultural value of Eastern um, hospitality, And then remember that it's Jesus in your house. This isn't just Uncle Frank that came by for a little visit. This is Jesus and his disciples. Would you be distracted by how your place looked or how you would feed the crowd or how many trips you had to make back to get food? See, it's not Martha that looks like the strange one in the story. It's Mary. And Mary wasn't distracted. In fact, Mary wasn't distracted with the lists of stuff that had to happen, the stuff that she needed to do. In fact, she was quite content right where she was. And Martha comes out, says, Do you not even care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So Martha's heart, initially, she's anxious. There's a lot going on. She feels overwhelmed. And Jesus is sitting in her house, and the first thing she does is she goes to try to get help. Mary, on the other hand, is sitting at Jesus' feet, and it's not that Mary's lazy. She could be. We don't really know that, right? Laziness is not of high regard biblically. Matthew 24 actually says, Who then is faithful and a wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at a proper time. 
Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Jesus talks a lot about working hard. He doesn't allude to us the fact that there's not more to do, that there's not stuff to do. Sometimes if you're, you know, participating in in any kind of local body or church, sometimes you can get pretty overwhelmed with how much stuff you can pack in. Sometimes even with all the stuff that you pack in, you feel like there's still seven more ministries that you could add that could still help to what's going on. And Jesus says to Martha, 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 you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few are necessary. Really only one. Martha's anxiety is very subtle. It has a selfish root, but its fruit looks deceptively like unselfishness. It's a desire for the approval dressed up to look like the desire to serve. It's my caring of what you think of me dressed up to look like my caring for you. It can be so subtle that we don't see it clearly. It looks so much like the right thing that we believe it's the right thing. And that's why Martha was confident that Jesus would agree with her about Mary. But Mary had chosen the one thing. I'm going to always go back to that one thing, and I'll tell you why. When you look at Martha, Jesus doesn't clearly come out with this exact question, but this is the question he's asking. Whom are you really serving? Whom are you really serving? It's that deceptive nature in ourselves to think that we're doing good things and they might be really, really good things. And we dress them up in this way of, of self-righteousness, of, of thinking about the, the actual need, the serving, more than the reason why we're serving. And Jesus says there's one necessary thing. The other way that the Bible talks about it is that God says, I am the good portion. Mary chose the good portion. Psalm 73, 26 says, Our bodies won't, well, it says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength of my heart and my portion forever. You see, Jesus was Mary's portion. The question is, is he yours? Jesus responds, not with Mary, go help your sister. He doesn't respond with Martha, you're being really bossy. There's a TV show if you really talk about Martha a lot. Martha, Martha, Martha. But Jesus responds with one necessary thing. And what's the one necessary thing? Thinking through, what do you guys think that the one necessary thing is? Do you think Jesus really, really needs food? There's so many times in our life, and I'm included, that we can get a, a wrong focus or a wrong picture. Let me, let me tell you it in a story this way. A couple days ago, um, I was talking to my boys. So I have a, a 11-year-old boy and a 9-year-old boy, Luke and Asher. Uh, and I'd asked them to do some work for me. And we had just gotten a new puppy. So we have a new puppy, a little German Shepherd, and he needs to be walked around. German Shepherds are pretty active dogs. They need to be walked a lot. So I told the boys, and I said, hey, guys, can you guys go take the the puppy around for a walk? And usually when I say a walk, like they do a couple laps around the, the house, the farm. So they'll make a couple laps. And Luke's initial response is he came up to me and he goes, Dad, um, do we just have to go for two walk or two two laps? Can we just do two? And I said, "Hey, I said I just want you to walk them." And two was kind of always my like that was the number I gave them as like the minimum, like you should at least do two. And that was that was what he was referring to. He came up and he's like, "Can we just do two?" And I said, "Luke, I said, what are you thinking about right now?" And he says, "I don't know." How many boys, you know, say, I don't know, right? Normal comment, right? 
But Luke all of a sudden looks at me and he goes, you know, can we just do two and come back in the house? I said, Luke, I said, are you really trying to figure out what the minimum in life is that you can possibly do to please me? Because if that's what you're trying to do, that's not where your heart should be. And then I had my nine-year-old Asher come up. And you know what Asher said? Dad, I walked him before. I did pretty well. And I said, hey. I said, Luke. I said, you know how you're trying to find the minimum in life that you can do to appease me? I said, Asher. I said, are you trying to, to brag and try to show that you've been doing really, really well? hey, look at me, pat on the back. I said, your heart's not really in the right place either. I said, neither of you actually love the dog. The puppy still needs walked. And I said, and if you truly love the puppy, you'll go out with a walk for him. And I said, and if if you walk a couple laps and he still looks like he needs another lap, what do you think a loving boy should do? This was an actual conversation. And then Luke came back. So do we just have to do three? (laughs) How often is that our response to God? How often can we come to God and say, God, what's the bare minimum I can do? You call me to, to be a servant for you. What do I have to do? And then I'll match that. That'll be what I need to do. Or there's other times where we come and we're like, hey, God, look at me. I'm doing all these other extra things. And God says, I'm not here for extra credit. I didn't even tell you to do those five things. I told you to do this. How many times have you guys given your kids some kind of direction and then they go off and do something that you didn't even tell them and you're like, hey, that's great. Now go back and do the exact same thing I told you the first time. So often, we don't, we, we neglect the one important thing. So Jesus comes to us in love and authority. So don't discount his authority because of his love for you. It is Christ himself who tells us what is truly necessary. The next time you're tempted to think that there are many earthly things that you must do, remember what he said. As the world careens on all of its frantic madness and many demands, insist on our attention. We can become people who choose to be still, sit at the Lord's feet, and listen to his voice. For it's in his word that we will receive the good portion we need most. The one thing that you all need as you leave here today is not to just go out and work harder. It's not to go home and get really, really frustrated because nothing else happened when you were gone. And I know that whether you thought your kids or your husband was going to clean up and do all those things, you know, hopefully you're surprised with that. Don't be shocked if it didn't happen. Just be happy when they survive, right? There are so many times, and I was thinking about this before, how often do women walk through life and you go from waking up early, trying to get breakfast, trying to get the kids ready, trying to get them to school, whether you drive them to school, then all of a sudden you either have to get yourself back to a job or to work, or if you're at home, like there's a whole lot of chores to do. And then after that, you got to pick up the kids, you got to run them to all these different practices, you got to come home, you got to make supper, you got to get ready, you got to also try to discipline and instruct the kids on top of everything that's going on. Then you put them to bed, and then the only thing that happens in your whole day is bitterness builds up because no one's helping. And it's a struggle for all of us. And that's where, I, when Heather and I were talking uh, at the marriage panel a little before, that's, that's the one thing that really struck me the most when it comes to me being able to help my wife. I know a lot of the men aren't here today, and this is, you know, sometime maybe I'll try to go out to, you know, talk to all the men in your life and try to tell them this, but when it really comes down to the men in your life, the men in your life sometimes instead of necessarily asking them to help, make sure that they have their portion too. Make sure that their one important thing is their one important thing. 
And there are a lot of men that need to go out and find out that there are times that, that women are stressed. And like I said, for Heather, it was during that time where all of a sudden kids were coming and she was just trying to shower and relax a little bit or she would sit down and she'd be in devotion and all of a sudden all the kids, and there's all these different bam, 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 bam. You might have text message. Sarah doesn't have to deal with it, but all of a sudden social media is like bam, 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 you know. But there's so many things that are going on in life and there are so often that we just get so focused on the thing that we're supposed to do or the thing that we're trying to serve instead of on Christ himself. I think there's still more time for me to talk, but I know that there's been a lot thrown at you today, and I don't want to just overwhelm you or overload you. What I want to do is just encourage you and have some more time to really talk and discuss together. So there is actually going to be a conversation break here. Uh, So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to release you guys over to a conversation break to just talk and discuss more about this. Wrestle with the same concept with each other and say, hey, how do we keep the one important thing? So if you guys would pray with me, Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We come to you because we know life is overwhelming. Sometimes there's a lot of stuff going on. And I know all the women today have a million things going through their mind. And I just cry out to you and I pray that you would continue to point them back to your son, Jesus Christ. That we would remember that you're the one important thing. Father, when life gets busy, you want a relationship with us just the way Martha and Mary had with you. We have the ability to speak to you You have the ability to sit at your feet and you listen to us. And I just ask and pray that you would show up in each of these women's lives and you would point them back to the grace that you have given them. That they would not find their identity in anything else but your son Jesus Christ. We don't have to check mark all the different boxes before we die to come to see you. But there is one important thing. We need to find you. And we are so grateful that you have given so much grace to all of us. That it's through your Son coming to die on a cross for our sins that you paid the price that we couldn't pay. You did the work and you don't require us to do any work more other than to love you. We ask and pray that you would give us a joy and a desire to want to do and to want to serve you. We wouldn't just ask and say, what's the bare minimum I have to do to please you? But we come before you and we say, God, I am grateful that you have given me the ability to serve you and it brings me great joy to do these things. And I just thank you for all these women and I just ask that you would just give them wonderful conversation continue to build relationship, to continue to go back to their family and to point you to their family, that they would remind their family that you're the one important thing. We praise your name. Amen.